Okay. <clears throat> okay, let's see here. So. Can you hear me online? No? Okay, good start. Um, that's good. Hey. Very soft. Okay. Uh, it's at my maximum. I'll speak up. That's all I can do. It looks okay on my end. Okay. All right. Wow, we've really dwindled in numbers, haven't we, since I was last here. It's good. Okay. People are coming in. All right, let's see. How many are in the hall? Oh, I don't even want to say the number, it's too depressing. <laughs> There's like 15 people here. Maybe more will come. How many are online today? 15, damn. Okay, so I know everyone's not here because they're very busy working on the project and things, right? That's what's happening. Um, welcome to week nine, not week 91. That was a typo. Um, yeah, good to be back. Hope you enjoyed the last few weeks of lectures. Hope you've enjoyed the project. Um, some people are saying iteration three is hell, so maybe that's why they're not here. Um, today's lecture is going to be very light because we do know you're in hell. We're going to talk about iteration four, which is a bit of a different iteration. Um, maybe a nice little break to what you're used to, hopefully. Um, and uh, yeah, talk a little bit about looking forward um, as we start to wrap up the course, which is very exciting and very sad. Um, the first thing though, and those of you who I had in 1511 are gonna know that I'm gonna be hamming on this for the next few weeks, is that the My Experience surveys are now available. So you've all got an email about it, Every term, that's right, you know the drill. And every term I ham on about it. Um, so for the first part of the lecture, the first five to 10 minutes, um, we're just gonna have time to do the My Experience survey. So we'll get it out of the way now, that we don't have to talk about it anymore, although of course I'll be talking about it. Um, who was in 1511 in T2 last year with me? Do you remember at the end we did, uh, we had like goals for the, um, yeah. So we'll, we'll do something similar this term. I gotta think what the goals will be. What, 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 were the, what did I do last term? So the end was the coffee machine stream, which we just hit. That was very weird for me. What were the other two goals? Yeah, that one we didn't hit, right? Yeah, yeah which I'm really glad about. Yeah, that would have been a nightmare. What were the first two? Oh, yeah, 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 which we did do as well. The coffee was the last, yeah, that was the last. Uh, maybe that was the three. It was the live stream with the tutors, the co coffee machine, and the question eight. So this term will do something similar. I was thinking for, for, the, for one of them, like Yu Chow and I could do some sort of, what's that? Some sort of tea tasting thing. I don't know. Um, we'll get some feedback from you guys with what we're gonna do. But to even get close to hitting that, we've gotta do the My Experience. So please, if you haven't already done it, let's, we'll spend five, 10 minutes right now doing the My Experience survey. Um, do you all know how to access it? Yeah, I know, roll your eyes. I know it's annoying, but they're very important. Um, and sometimes, like, um, th they're not only important, like, the course might be pretty good or whatever, there might be little issues, but they're useful for us to be able to say, like, oh, let's get more resources. Can we get a bit more money to improve the course and do something different? Um, so yeah, please, um, it's, you can go to uh, student.unsw.edu.au slash my experience, or you would have all been emailed um, an email with your link to it. They're completely anonymous if, you're, if you haven't heard that before. So we can't get access to who's done it, what you've said. We just get access to um, what percentage of people have completed it, which is what we'll use for the, um, the goals. And we'll release the goals um, soon. So please, let's go five, five minutes. 
Why can't I scroll? And let me know when you start completing them. Same for online, actually. For online, I can paste the URL in. Why is there a chair here? Very strange. Still tracking me, that's nice. <laughs> yes, we could do a keyboard reveal, someone's asking online. Although I've done that before. He's got to find the right lecture stream. Can't even edit the title, whatever. Starting to finish, are we? Close or finished? Who's finished? Everyone? Anyone need a couple more minutes? Didn't add any comments because I couldn't be asked. That's mean. Who needs a couple more minutes, anyone? Okay, a couple, yeah, that's right.
Done? All done? Yes? Thumbs up? Okay, cool. You can finish up another time if, we're, if you need it. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we'll release some, some goals or something like that later in the week. Okay, so for the first part of the lecture, what I thought we'd talk about is the upcoming iteration four, which is something a bit different. So it's not um, just another group iteration like we've been doing. Um, and it's actually the first time we've, we've done something like this in this course. So in previous terms, right, this lecture would have been exam prep um, because instead of iteration four, this would have been the final iteration of the project and we would have just started getting ready for an exam. Um, <laughs> AR is saying, please let it be easy, God. Um, yeah, we'll talk a bit what it'll, what it'll look like, what we are expecting. Um, so if you think about an exam, is, is like three hours plus a bunch of um, study hours, right? It's going to be about equivalent um, time spent. What I'm hoping, though, is that it's just more enjoyable. Maybe that's laughable. Um, you're sick of the project. But um, hopefully when I explain what the idea is, you'll be a bit, a bit more excited. So iteration one was basic functionality. Iteration two was building the web server. Three was completing the life cycle, right? Front end, back end. And iteration four is all about extending. Um, So there's two parts to iteration four. Let me actually, I've got uh, there's some notes written up here. So 40% of iteration four, I don't know if you can read this, but don't worry, I'll just speak it out. 40% of iteration four is some basic functionality. So you know, you'll get a spec just like you've always been given. Um, I think it's only a few routes, yeah, two routes of medium difficulty. So it's really a really small implementation. Um, but um, iteration four is all individual. So you're no longer working in your groups. Um, you will all be given, um, so the way it's going to work is kind of interesting and we're hoping it actually works. You'll all be given a fork of your group's project at the end of iteration three. And that's the basis that you'll use to work on iteration four. Does that make sense? If, however, for some reason, um, your iteration three project is unusable, we will have a base um, iteration three ready for your, your individual contribution. But we don't really want you to do that. We want you to be able to just keep on going on with what you're used to. So it's just there for a backup. Um, and so, yeah, so someone's asking online, will any issues that our group had for iteration three reduce our mark for iteration four? The answer is no. If you're at a point where iteration three, your group's iteration three is so messed up that it's going to cause you issues completing your iteration four, all you have to do is speak to your tutor and we'll give you access to our base iteration three solution. Okay? But again, we, we don't want that. If that's happening, you're already on the back foot. We don't really want that to happen. We want you to be able to continue on. Um, oh, I... Uh, AR11 said, isn't that just the extra criteria for last term's iteration three? No, no, it, it's different. So these are different routes that you'll be completing. So you'll complete some spec stuff on your own, and that's 40% of the iteration four mark. OK? Any questions with that side of it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to be a, your, your tutor will probably let you know if you need our iteration three. But it's, it's not going to be a common occurrence, so don't worry about it. Any other questions on this part of it? How are you feeling? What do you think? Is this better or worse than an exam? You'll see? I don't know. No strong feelings one way or the other. OK, the other 60% of the mark is what I'm more excited about, because I think it's really cool. Um, and it's just to make something completely up to you and add it to the project. There's no spec, there's no, well, we'll have a little bit of rough guidelines, um, but it's, it's completely up to you. Do you want to add new features to the system? You can do that. Do you want to change how the system is using persistence? You know, build in a real database, you could do that. You can do anything you want. Is there some technology that you've been hearing about um, that you're really keen on trying, but you haven't had the time or the motivation? You can try and integrate it into the project. Um, you can do whatever you want, and it's worth 60%. All we're um, requiring is that it should be about 20 hours of work for full marks. 
So you can't go off and say like, I made the text bold, that was my feature. I'm really proud of it, and then the, give me my marks. So we will be um, assessing what you've created. The way we'll be doing that is you'll make a quick video um, demonstrating whatever it is you've done. Now, someone's asking online, does it have to require front-end work? Absolutely not. If you're like, I want to do something really cool on the back, I want to try this new database system, um, you can do that. And I'll start talking about some technologies that um, interest me and excite me and that I think could be cool to integrate into this project um, in the next part of the lecture. And those are some ideas. Some will be front end, some will be back end. Um, if you can't think of anything, we have some ideas um, in the spec. And I'll run through them today. Yeah. But we don't want you to do those. I want you to come up with your own thing that's really cool. Um, yeah. This is the kind of thing that will serve you throughout your career, right? If you, you could build something cool here and talk about it in a job interview one day. That's, that's what I want. Yeah. And that's why I'm more excited about this than something like an exam, which is just like, yeah, you do the exam and hopefully we don't stuff you over with a hard question or two and hopefully you study the right thing. This is just a bit more practical. Um, so AR, so we've got some questions online. Can we work as a group? No, this is an individual project. The other reason I introduced this um, is that we get a lot of feedback, sometimes, actually not much anymore to be honest, but we get some feedback that's like, um, I lifted all the members of my group, I did all the hard work, it's not fair. Well now it's like, you're, that person's in a really good position for iteration four, and the other group members um, maybe won't be. Does that make sense? So um, it's completely individual. Um, someone's asked, what if one feature takes me all 20 hours? Yeah, that's, I mean, some features will take you 2,000 hours. <laughs> it all depends on what you build, right, and if it's valuable. Um, but again, if you can't say, like, I made the text bold, that took me 20 hours, I had to pick the right font from Google Fonts, that was about 15 hours, then I had to download the font, I got really slow internet, that was about two hours, you know. We're not going to entertain that. But if you can do one thing for this. In fact, that's what I'm expecting, one feature. Um, yeah. Okay, you need your tutor's approval of the feature. This is to safeguard against the font thing and so that you don't spend 20 hours on something that we go, no. So by Friday, where did I just read this? Friday, 10 p.m. week 10, we'll send out an announcement, don't worry. Um, all you've got to do is uh, write, you know, have a quick conversation over Teams or in the tutorial and be like, I'm thinking of doing this, what do you think? And the tutor will be like, oh yeah, 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 think about this, what about this, and you're done, that's it. Um, so you just need a quick sign off, that's to safeguard you so you don't spend time on something. Um, <laughs> We're getting some funny students in the chat asking about italics. Ask your tutor, and hopefully they'll say no. Um, yeah, and that's it. Exciting? Okay, AR11 in his um, huge optimism says, I'm thinking about not bothering. Um, the bonus feature stuff, I'm pretty sure this is correct, the way it's written into the spec, into the course outline, is technically optional. So you're not going to fail if you don't complete a bonus feature. You just won't get those marks. But you do need to do the spec route, the 40%. The you need to attempt that. But we don't want, that's not fun, yeah. It's, the route is, is 100% of the route is 40% of iteration four. Is that answering your question or not? Yeah. Uh, there's no fail though. It's not a hurdle. You'll just get 40% of the marks added to your final score. Does that make sense? Um, someone's asked, can we just do front-end stuff? Does it have to be back-end? Um, back-end probably makes a little bit more sense for this course, right? But you can do front-end, as long as you get it cleared by your tutor. As long as you're doing something interesting, though, not just redoing the, the, you know, some styles or changing some colors. Um, if you add, for example, like front-end caching, that's cool. OK, that's a cool feature. Um, yeah, maybe your motivation will be back. Yeah, that would be good. Um, okay, any more questions online or in person on this? Are we excited about it, maybe? You just want iteration three over, I'm guessing. Actually, you probably just want the whole course over. 
Are we, are we done? <laughs> What's happening? Everyone looks very tired. Yeah, I understand. Um, okay. We'll release more information on how we're getting the, fork, the re forked repos to you individually um, after iteration three. Okay. So some suggestions that we've included. Oh, the camera stopped following me. That's really annoying. So some suggestions that we've included. Um, Hangman on the front end. So this is a front end only feature um, who was asking online. Um, so for example, in the actual chat of the team, of you know, the messaging app that you've got, um, you could you know, have some command that when you send that command, you start a game of Hangman with, with, the, bat, with the app. Um, so you have to submit an individual. I don't know how well you can read this. Probably not very well. You'll get access to this. Um, but you can guess individual letters, and you're playing ha Hangman with the app. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can achieve this. And this is the point, right? So unlike all of the other stuff that's been very tight, strictly adhered to a spec, there's no solution for these. Right? It's up to you. So don't, don't think that you can come to help sessions or your tutor. And you can ask general, like, how would you solve this problem? But don't think that we're going to be showing you or helping you solve this entire. The whole idea is that think of this as like an extension or a HD task. Right? We want you to show off to us with what you can do. Um, you can use ASCII art to play the game, things like that. You can have a dictionary of words. You know, there's a lot of ideas there. So another front-end idea is dark mode. So a lot of you always complain when we don't stream in dark mode with, you know, that text editors and things. So um, how would you add something like dark mode to the front-end of the app? Um, and maybe, like, make it toggleable, right? So that you can switch between front -end, uh, light mode and dark mode and that you can um, have that follow the system, for example. That's a pretty cool feature um, that's very common these days. Um, Someone's asking, can we change some completed functions from previous iterations to fit the new features? Absolutely. There's no auto, that's a good question. There's no auto test, other than the 40% spec stuff, there's no auto test, of course, for these bonus features. And it doesn't, we're not retroactively testing it. So if you need to change how things are working, all right, because you're doing some little refactor to, to support your new feature, that's absolutely fine. Or, as Tam's pointed out, you can bump the API versions. Yeah, that's a good idea as well. Uh, so ARs asks, what if I add advertisements for iteration four for some passive income? That's a good idea. Um, cool. Okay, some more ideas that are cool. Um, for the front end, supporting uh, LaTeX or Markdown. So that, you know, you know you've used Markdown before, I'm assuming. Um, obviously, if you send Markdown messages, then they're not supported in, in the application. But what if they were? What would that look like? That's a cool idea. And it's actually not too hard to build something like that. Um, all right, some of these ones are also really exciting. So databases. So at the moment, you're using the data store, right, which is just like a JSON object. This, that is, I think out of everything in the project, that's the most removed from reality. Um, it's a very simple, quick thing that we did. We used to have da databases, but it became too much time talking about it. Um, and as much as you might not think this, we do try not to give you too much to do. But it's a balance. But so adding something like that for the data store is really cool. Um, there's so many solutions out there for something like this. Type ORM is a really cool um, NPM library that lets you have typed data, uh, you know, data store stuff that uses an actual database. And it's configurable, so you can change the type of database that you use. I'll talk more about um, other databases that I like for TypeScript. Um, so that's a cool one. Another one, this one I'm really um, hoping that some people do, is to uh, change the entire project to be Docker-based. Um, so is anyone familiar with Docker? Or you've probably at least heard of it around. So who's heard of it? And then who's like used it? Ooh, nice. Um, well, do you want to, I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you say why it's useful? A little bit? What did you think of it? Mm. 
yeah, so I'll just repeat it for the stream. Um, um, it makes you isolate your, so for example, your front end from your back end are like isolated containers, basically. Um, and that, and, um, and um, there's a lot of benefits to that. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about Docker in a moment, because I really like Docker. Or a new idea. This is, and this is what I actually really hope you do. Just something along these lines. Um, come up, think about it, get excited, and, and build something cool. Um, someone's asked, is Docker hard? It can be tricky, but the benefits far outweigh um, the challenge, I think. Questions? Talk, talk a bit about Docker. Actually, um, Docker is like, you probably hear about it all the time, but maybe you um, don't quite know what Docker is or don't quite get why it's so um, useful. I, I, now, anytime I spin up a project now that's going to be more than just a really quick script, I pretty much from the beginner, beginning build it to be a Docker-based system. So what Docker is, so here's the problem that led us to needing Docker, right? This is always the best way to introduce something. So you used to write like a front end and a back end and a database, just like you've done for this project. And you just, you're working on it locally. Um, the problem is you go to then deploy it, right? So you, you go to a real server somewhere and you, you want to go deploy it. And that operating system is slightly different to yours, very common. You might have developed on a Mac. That's probably a Linux machine. Or you might have developed on a Linux machine with a slightly different version to the one that's being deployed on. And those small differences might cause problems. You might have a different version of some library that you need to use, like OpenSSL, and then all of a sudden it's not working on production. That's a, a super common problem. Um, it might have a different database server than you were expecting. Or it, maybe it all works, and then a year later, Whoever controls your server updates the operating system, and um, it stops working. Right? You, you write these systems, these servers, and they rely on the operating system environment to an extent. Um, and that's a problem, because you made assumptions when you were building it that what should, should or shouldn't be available. So what Docker lets you do is basically say, OK, I'm writing this server. It's a, you know, a TypeScript server. It's using Express.js. right? Um, and not only is, is this the, the app that I'm building, I'm going to specify exactly what I want my operating system to look like. Um, in fact, why don't I get up an example? So this is a project I've been working on recently. Uh, no, that's just the front end, though. So this is a, a, a Docker Compose file. So this is how I'm specifying in this project um, the different components of my app, right? my front end, my back end, my database. But I'm also specifying the image. And the image is like if you could write down what you want your operating system to look like. And so what this is, this is an image called Node 18, Alpine. So we can actually go Google that. So you know, you're writing a Node server. So Node actually provide Docker um, images with lots of different versions, right? So we might say, I need Node version 18. Um, for example, like this. And this, they've written um, sort of this base um, environment. So it's pulling from this base image called Alpine, so you can go to look at what that includes. Um, and basically, these are versions of Linux, um, but they're consistent. That's the, key. That's the key. So when I'm developing locally with Docker, I'm getting this exact operating system at these exact versions with these exact packages on this exact platform. And when you go to deploy it, it's the exact same simulated environment. So it's really, really, really useful. It's also really useful if you're working in teams because you've all got the exact same environment. That no more are you like, oh, I remember like pre-Docker, which Docker is not actually, it's kind of a recent, maybe past five, 10 years, but um, like before Docker, you would always have like these discussions where like someone working on the project, it kept crashing because 
they have a different version of something and then you, you spend like an hour trying to fix it and figure out what's going wrong. All of those problems sort of go away um, when you switch to something like Docker. Although you start having to fix Docker specific issues and that, but it's a trade-off. But there's, it's really cool because so, then you can say, okay, there's my front-end app. It's running on that server. There's my back-end app. It's running on that image. Um, you know, here's my database. It's running on that image, right? And you specify all these parts of your application. So in this project I've got, this is pretty standard, like for a front-end, back-end sort of system, it's pretty standard. You've got your database, your, um, like your web server, your back-end, your front-end, and that's something for the database as well. And then you just, you go docker compose up. I think docker's quit, I'm like, it's not gonna run. But, and it just brings up all the different components. It sets up all the networking between them. It's all really consistent and nice. So I, I love Docker. Um, if you've never played around with it, this could be the best, um, a really good time to have a go. Um, and it's pretty simple for you. You've got the front end, you've got the back end, and um, maybe you could even add something like a database container for your uh, database. But you're not actually even having to change the source code. You're just making it work within Docker. Um, someone said, oh, I'm considering an API for ChatGPT, but that seems like too much effort. It's actually probably really not much effort. The API is really simple to use. That could be cool, though. Someone says, if we pick Docker for iteration four and then start on it, but we find it too hard, can we switch to something else? Um, that's a good question. You can. The other thing is, like, if you pick something ambitious and you don't quite get there, you can still show what you've built in your video, right? It's, it's only 20 hours. It's not a huge amount of time. We, we're aware of that. So if, if, you, if you pick something ambitious and you get quite close, but you're not quite right, um, that's fine. You can still submit that as your iteration for. Yeah. The other thing is, like, we still want to help you. So especially if it's something that you have a tutor that happens to know about it, or I happen to know about it, and you run into a problem, you can come past my office, post on the forum, and we'll try help you. It's, I'm just saying we might not be able to help you depending on what you decide to build. Cool. Um, so Docker's a really good one. Another one, like I mentioned, is, is a database. So especially if you're using Docker, it's so easy because you just add a, like a database container that lives in your project, and it generates like a URL that you connect to, and then you can just use a database to replace your data store. But you could do this without Docker as well. Um, so I've been using um, MongoDB with Mongoose lately, which I know sounds ridiculous, but... Um, so Mongoose is, is a TypeScript or a JavaScript package that lets you connect um, your node servers to a MongoDB database. And th this is one of these modern um, NoSQL databases. So um, it's really simple to get started with, right? So you just like, um, in fact, it's just like this. You just like import it. You get this Mongoose object. Um, you can connect to your database, right? And then all you do instead of, it's really similar to the data store, because there's no SQL, what, is what, what I mentioned. So you say like, um, in this example, they're defining the schema for a blog post. A blog post has an author, a title, a body, a date. So you create this like schema object, you, you register it, and then you can just save blog posts to this real database. So you might need to just, you have to have like a channel, right? And a channel is a title and an array of messages, and a message is this. So you build up your schema pretty simply, and then you can just start saving to it. In fact, um, in this exact same project, this is what I was using. So I'm connecting to some Mongo database, and then I have um, my schema here. So whatever your, you know, your data looks like, whatever's in your data store.json, you just make the equivalent here. And then, so for example, here's how I create it. So I say I want to make a new, I'm going to create a new thing that adheres to my schema, and here's the data that I want. You can sort of see how you can map what you've got to this, right? But the, the benefit of this is it's a real um, database under the hood. You can do backups, you can move it over, 
um, it's going to scale and it's not running in memory, it's persisted, not to a file, sort of it's, you know, it's good, you get the benefits. Okay, some online uh, questions. Um, so this would work if I could debug it, could still potentially get full marks. It, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to say, right? Um, you gotta show that you've built something um, interesting and maybe it's just not fully working. I feel like implementing a database is gonna mean that I spend 20 hours changing all my old functions. Look, I don't, I don't actually think it would because all you'd have to change is the data store side. Everything else getting the data is the same if you do it right. Yeah, you would only need to update persistence, yeah. Um, AR has asked, do we need tests for our new features? Uh, if you happen to have the time for it, I mean, it doesn't hurt to build it, but we're probably not too concerned about that considering you have about 20 hours. Um, so yeah, if spend the time building the thing. That's what we'll be looking at. Not, we're not looking for a full feature complete, you know, start to end tested thing. And you can do SQL if you want to. Look, we, we, you can do whatever you want. Like, I'm not gonna really say no to anything, as long as it's interesting. All right, anything else worth talking about? Okay, the video presentation. Um, two minute video, so really short, right? We're not looking to pick you apart and to really scrutinize, like we'll be scrutinizing the project, making sure that what's in the video is there. Um, but all we want you to do, two to, th two to three minutes, explain what you've implemented and how it works, why you chose the feature, and a demonstration of it working. If you've built some backend only thing, um, you can just show the whole system working and then just show the code and what, what you've done. If you've built something visual, obviously you just show the visual side of it. Um, we will provide you a place to upload the video. We're using something called Flipgrid. It's the first time I've used it, but it's part of Office 365, apparently, which is cool. And there's, I mean, a million different tools you can use to record the video. I'm assuming I don't need to go over that. Apparently, Canva has a new present and record mode, which could be cool. But you can use QuickTime on your Mac or whatever system you want to use to make the video. We're not judging the presentation of the video. But obviously, make sure you, we can understand what you're saying and that it's all, it looks okay. Um, so some instructions here that'll all be part of the repo and I'll leave it there for the for that discussion. Cool. Any questions? Yeah, you can use ABS too, yes, of course. Do we need to show it working on the front end? Um, it's probably a good idea, especially if you've built something that if you've built something that affects the front end. You should show the front end. Um, you know what? In fact, it's probably always a good idea to show it working with the front end because even if you like change the database, you want to show that it works, right? It's a it's a nice, easy, quick way to show that it works. Probably, it's a, probably a good idea, right? Even if you just you know do a few things, you know, show that it's working. If you're doing something with persistence, quit it, reopen it, show that it stayed. Persistent, yeah. Is it a must? I don't know why you wouldn't, I guess, is my point. There might be some, some cases where, I, I think, yeah, I think show it. I, I don't know if we should mandate it, but you should show it. Is converting the front end to an executable program something we could do? What do you mean by that? Do you mean making it like a native app rather than a web app? That could, that's a cool idea, actually. Like making it work in Express or something. Is that what you mean? Yeah. That would be awesome. I'm not going to say no to anything. As long as it's cool and um, you get to try something new, I'm, that's, I'm excited. But again, if you're like really over this, these are technically, uh, I, I wouldn't call them bonus marks, but this is not a hurdle. Right? I don't want to pressure people into wasting 20 hours building something that um, is just a waste of time for everyone involved. Does that make sense? 
It doesn't matter that the front end wasn't your work. You know, it's the software engineering part of taking a front end, making a, a, a native app, making sure that it still works with the back end. That's probably about 20 hours of work. I don't know, maybe, we'll see. Depends on, there's some solutions that are probably too simple, some that are okay. Uh, you have the front end though, right? So you just, um, you'd have to change it, the front end. You could commit it to your iteration for repo, the front end. Yeah, and just, and then the video would obviously show the front end. That's a good point actually. But I think, yeah, just include it in the iteration for repo. Any more questions? Nope. Quick break. Yes, you guys are killing me. You guys are so, so what's going on? All right, we'll, we'll talk after. All right, quick break, guys. Stretch your legs, get a coffee, go to the bathroom, and we'll be back in five, ten minutes. Yes, no?
Okay, so I thought um, what we'll do a little bit is talk about um, some of the iteration three stuff because there's, there's about a five days left. Um, so just some important information that I think you might already know or should know. Let me, hold on, also fix this thing. Hello? Okay, cool. Um, you can see this, hopefully. So you've probably noticed some, some issues with our runners for iteration three, yes, with the pipelines. Um, so a few things. If you've tested um, like ESLint um, and you've run Jest locally and everything's looking okay, um, it's okay to force merge if our pipelines aren't getting the result to you quick enough or if they're just th failing and it looks like they're failing. This has popped up every term. I've done the best I can. The, the issue is there's um, a lot of you. <laughs> there's a lot of code running tests and they're all running on our local CSC servers, on our local deployment of GitLab and basically the servers can't keep up. I ask for more resources every term and we get some stuff, but it's, it's a tall order, I, so I understand. But it's out of our control a little bit. I'm looking at moving to like a cloud deployment in the future. It's just gonna be a lot of work and um, potentially a lot of money, but that's okay. Um, it's more the work at getting everything migrated. But all I'm trying to say is, yeah, if things are working locally um, and it, it, the ESLint's passing, Jess is passing, um, it's probably okay to force the merge. Um, yeah, so someone's saying their pipeline failed even though it passed on the merge request. So, so that's an example where it's likely just the pipeline crashing. Um, so it's okay to merge it. Um, if you get really screwed over by something, uh, um, we'll work with you, right? We're not, we know this is our fault. Um, So if you're, a lot of you I know, are, um, it's the toughest part of the term, I think, in terms of just general energy and stuff. So if you're struggling with iteration three, um, Tam mentioned this in the chat, but I'll repeat it now. Um, and so I'm reading off something, so that's why I'm looking down. Um, if, you're con if you convert your iteration two to support iteration three requirements, so what I mean by that is using tokens in the headers to th and throw an error um, and all of that stuff, um, this is about 50% of the iteration three auto mark grade, just by doing a few of those busy work conversions. Okay, so iteration three is worth a bit less than iteration two. So you've done the biggest iteration already. Um, so if you just do those few things, which shouldn't be too much work, um, especially if you're doing it as a group effort, that's already 50% of the mark. Okay, so I just want to try and reassure you a bit that we know we know how, where you're feeling and how it's going. Is there anything, any questions on those two points? No? How are we going with iteration three? Do we, are we on track for five more days? Yeah? Yes? That's, I know that's like the thousand yard stare, yes, yes. <laughs> How are you guys, you're okay? Maybe not? Have you converted the functions? More or less, okay. Well then that's already 50% of the way there. That's okay, not bad. Um, the other thing with this course now that there's no exam is that it's like very easy to predict your, over, your final grade. So there's a light at the end of the tunnel, right? Um, the leaderboard, I think we slightly changed the schedule that we're running it because of Easter. Um, but is it Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Or is it moved to Sunday now? It was something like that, I can't quite remember. But it's on, it's, it was sent somewhere, wasn't it? Sorry? Yeah, the dates were sent in the announcement, or no? On the spec, yeah, the, we updated the dates on the spec, yes. Thank you. So check the spec, AR. Cool. You'll get there, I believe in you all. Um, I already mentioned yesterday, there's no new lecture concepts, right? So now I'm basically trying to fill time. Um, another few things to talk about, you might not be ready to think about it, but looking forward in your CSC career, um, some other courses that are probably gonna be very relevant now that you've 
you're in 1531. Um, so Comp 2511 um, is OO design and programming, but it's basic. It's like a programming paradigms course. Um, very uh, interesting and cool stuff. The other one you might be more interested in now is Comp 6080. Does anyone know that course? So that's taught by Hayden, who does a lot of um, the 1531 stuff, obviously. Um, and that's the front end course, so all front end. Um, really cool course as well. You know, most of the grads that go off to software jobs after one um, after uh, UNSW um, are working on some web product, right? Um, so 6080 is a really logical course. Wednesday, Friday, Sunday is the um, leaderboard days. So today, today. Do you, is there any other course questions, course progression? Um, and then I was thinking we could do some Q and A. We could recap a topic, something like that. I would love to do a Kahoot, but their limits are really crap now without a license. AR said tank, and I don't know what that means. It's having a small breakdown on, online. Any course progression questions? Units? Oh, it's Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Tam is clarified. Someone help me out. Someone ask a, <laughs> someone ask a question. Um, kind of odd how a popular course like 6080 only has 400 slots. I didn't know it has 400. Are you sure it's not 400 a term? Is it 400 a year? Um, is 2511 important to do um, early in our career? In our degree, sorry. So that's um, uh, the object-oriented course. Um, probably after 1531 is a good point. Which is not really that early now, is it? This is like, are you all in second year, roughly? No, later? Second year, third year? At the back? First year? Yeah, so yeah, okay, you're all over the place. But it's about uh, end of first year, beginning of second year, roughly. For most people, not everyone, of course. So maybe about after this is, is um, a good time to take 2511. Um, so, okay, 60, 80, 200 per term. You can always give feedback to the school that you think the enrollments should be lifted. Um, you can do that through uh, your um, Sturep, Sturep, CSC Selk, Stureps, um, or you can send me an email. I didn't know that it was that small actually, so it's worth pointing out. Um, so Tam's also saying, I also really recommend 2041. It's the less known course. Yeah, actually, if I could take a course, I think it would be 2041. Um, so it's helpful Unix tools. Well, I mean, I can take the course. I, I just don't have time. Um, helpful, uni useful Unix tools that help with pretty much all other courses. Um, it's funny when you're like working with software engineers and you've, you see someone that like really knows Unix. It's always very impressive. Um, so 2041 is yeah, a nice little course. I think it's. It was built by Andrew Taylor, which is always a good sign. I don't know who's teaching it, though. Tam might know. Um, it's always hard to tell if AR is being funny with his comments. But what is Unix again? So it's all like, it's, I think it's like the Bash course, right? If I'm, if I'm thinking of the right one. Yep. Any... One five three one questions. Any concepts that are throwing you off? Do we want to do? Someone mentioned yesterday that we're wanting to go through MapReduce filter again. Is that of interest to anyone? Some people are like no. Yes. Go through the API concepts again. Yeah, we can do that. What were you? Were you yes to filter stuff? Who wants to do map filter reduce? And who wants to do? Um, HTTP and what was the other one? Persistence. Okay, that one. Okay, which part? The HTTP first or the persistence? Persistence. Persistence. HTTP. Okay, we can do both. AR says neither. AR, you're killing me today. Um, all right, let's do that.
Um, okay, let's do persistence first, and then we'll do HTTP. That sound good? Am I just going to run through the slides again, or did you want to? Is that? Uh, I'll go through it sort of quickly, and then we'll focus on the thing that's causing strife. Is that a good plan? Yes. I don't know if I gave this this lecture, did I? Was this you, Chow? Week five? Yeah, this was you, Chow. Um, okay, yeah, let's talk about it. Um, yeah, let's talk about persistence. Persistence is, is one of the critical parts of a project, and I mentioned that in the in the um, one five three one project, it's probably the the component that's the most removed from reality. Remember, I said that, and that's because you're not really doing real persistence. We give you a, a data store, and I think you save it to a JSON file. Um, you would never do anything like that to store your data. Um, There's two types of memory, right? There's memory, short-term memory, right? Running program memory, and there's storage memory. Anything that we need to persist over time, that we need to save, we need to put it in some sort of long-term storage. It's a very simple concept. What's the big trade-off between short-term? Why don't we just use long-term storage for everything? Why do we have memory, like program memory? It's uh, it's way faster, yeah, yeah. So, sh you know, program memory or RAM is really, really, really fast. The downside is it's, it doesn't persist. So if you lose power to your memory device, um, you lose the storage. Obviously not a good um, idea if we want to keep things in the long term. So modern applications use a framework like this. You have your interface layer, that's your um, front end, the thing that your users actually click and touch and type into. You have your business logic layer, and that is basically, if you think about, so when someone uses your, the app that you're building, right, they go to the website, they type in a chat message, it sends a HTTP request to the server with the message, and then that HTTP function calls some other functions, right? That's the business logic. I don't know why we call it business logic. It's such a boring term. But it's like the actual logic of your application. Call this function, check this thing, throw this error. That's the logic that's happening there. That's obviously all... Um, memory. Then you have your services layer. Um, uh, which is like the way you interface with your data layer. You should, I think that's what it's trying to refer to here. So um, Remember before I mentioned there's this MongoDB database thing and I use something called Mongoose, right? That's the way I'm inter interacting with my database. The reason we do that is because um, it's usually not efficient to write really raw SQL statements to interact with databases anymore. We don't do that anymore. We have a layer in between that makes it a lot easier for us to go from like a JSON object to persistence. Um, and then you obviously have at the bottom the, the data layer. This is like an actual database. Um, Running on system. So what is a database? A database is a program um, whose job it is to, to take data in some format and save it to zeros and ones on disk in some sort of format that it knows how to deal with. Um, and unless you're working as a database researcher or a database engineer, which is not a very, you know, as a proportion, not a big field, right? Um, we sort of don't think too much about how it works. A lot of it is, it's been built over many, many years, lots of efficiencies, lots of research. Um, we abstract ourselves from it as much as we can. We, we have our interface to that database. We say, here's the data. Here's the way I want it stored. Please do it in the most efficient and sane way. Um, there's three main ways to store data. In memory, right? This is what we spoke about. So your data store before you save it to a JSON file, is a completely in-memory, non-persistent. Um, I don't even know if you would call it a database. It's, that's why we call it a data store. It's not really a database. It doesn't meet the requirements. But it is, it is storing data. Um, you can have an in-file database. This is starting to get more database-y. And this is where you, you, know, you save it to like a, a data.json file. You actually save it to disk. And that is persistence. You turn the computer off, you turn the computer back on, and you're going to get the data back. You can read it from the file. 
Um, it works. There's big problems with it. You would never use it for a big application. What are some of those problems? Anyone know? Say that again, louder. Yeah, that's a good one. So um, if something goes wrong and you, you screw up the file, um, you're pretty screwed. So, and that, basically, the short of it is there's not a lot of resilience built into this format. The other issue is, is really simple. Um, let's say you've got a JSON file, which is your data store. You are going through and you need to update the username of someone, some user account. So you scan through the file, you're looking for the, you find the user, you change the name, and while you were doing that, some other thread came along to read the file. It's going to be corrupted, most likely. So it's not multi-threaded, which is a big problem for web servers. Because the way web servers work is that you get many requests at the same time. They all need to interact with the data store, the database. And by default, a file is just going to explode. So then, and then you start doing things like, okay, well, if I just lock the file until it's finished, and then you've now got a really slow system. So d good databases are concurrent. They allow multiple requests to do multiple things at the same time. As long as they're touching different, you know, obviously you can't have two things modify a username at the exact, exact same time. But that, that's not common, right? And you'll just queue it up. And then you've got an, an actual database. Uh, and there's even a few ways to have databases. You can have relational SQL databases, no SQL databases. So MongoDB is an example of a no SQL da data database. So you never write any SQL. Um, your, your typical like MySQL database, um, Postgres, are uh, SQL databases. That's like the, the um, tried and true sort of um, old school ways. And as you go down the list, the barrier to entry becomes higher. There's a bit more work involved. But the performance is really good. So COMP3311, that's John Shepard's course on databases. Is, uh, has anyone taken it? No, not, probably not yet. If you are looking, this is another really good um, elective or course to take, um, 3311. Um, so yeah, persistence about keeping things in memory. Uh, and then obviously for iteration two, you added an, a uh, data store, right, using JSON, which works for the scope of your project. Um, and hopefully you've got it working by now. So as a high level, does that all sit well and make sense, the persistence? Actually, you wanted to do HTTP anyway. Who, who wanted to do persistence? Is there something that we want to talk more about specifically? Saving and loading? For the project side of it, you mean? Or just general? Project. Um, sure, let's get up. Um, I've closed it, damn. In fact, why don't I do Okay, what's a good way to because I can't show the project, right? So what's a good way of doing this? Yeah, all right. Why don't we just do a yeah, okay, good idea. All right, let's do that. All right, give me a second. Um Make the persistence dot do a TypeScript file. Oh, not make the damn. Okay. Can you all see this? Okay. Oop, what have I done here? Can I say this okay? Yes? I'll close this, I think. All right, so we could have like a function, um, save data. We have data. We don't know what that looks like. 
um, and we, we have that. Um, we can have a, so usually there's a few things we do with any type of persistence, okay? You need to set up the data store, like register the schema, create the file, create the database. Um, you need a way to query and you need a way to write, like that's the most common thing. So we can have this init, and what we can write with, um, with um, GitHub Copilot, see how it goes. So we're going to just use a file-based data store for this one, right? Does that sound good? Um, so we need to create the file itself. One thing you can do is just create the file like yourself on the file system in advance. So we could call it data store.json. Um, but we might, we might want to say, oh, in fact, oh, whatever. So we can go create the data store.json file in the current directory. Let's see what GitHub Copilot, yeah, sure if it doesn't exist. Um, okay. Uh, oops. Oops. Node.js create file. Node.js create file. Okay. Something like this. Yes, I need to do that. Install the types. All right, so we have this file system dot create uh, dot. Yep, that looks good to me. Um, so we're going to create a data sort of JSON in a read mode. No, that's opening it. We don't want to open. Yeah, write file is what I was looking for. Why aren't I getting... Okay. Why aren't I getting... Should I do... Let's see if that worked. Uh, and actually, I should delete this file, see if it creates it. Um, TS node persistence. I think there's an error somewhere. Uh, where's this error here? Okay, that's probably better. Okay, it doesn't like that, but that's okay. Doesn't like that. Did that create persistence? Oh, I didn't call it, of course. Um, and then we want to go init database. 
Cool, and then we get this data store.json file. So we've created the file that we'll use um, to store some data. What we can do, cool. Um, close this, close this, close this, close this, close this. Data store, keep this open. Um, a common thing we can do is just have the data store be an object which contains an array of the data that we're storing. Um, okay, well, what do we, what's some, what do we want to store in this data file? Copilot's given me some suggestion. Is there something else we want to store? Should we just follow Copilot? Tough crowd today. Um, looks like cars. We can call this data, right? Which is a very boring um, thing to store, but whatever. So we have name, age, cars, which is an array itself of objects with a name and array of models, uh, car models. And so we could have something like, um, you know, function get first user. Okay. So we want to, yeah, read the data store JSON file and return the first user. So we have to take this object that's in the file, turn it into an in memory object, and then we can do whatever we need to do to it. Um, so we do fs.read file, um, this looks good, so we're reading datasaw.json, whoops, in our function and we get this data object, if there's an error, throw an error, otherwise let's just log the data, that makes sense to me. Uh, and then let's um, call this function get first user. So this is just going to see if we're able to. Whoops. And what is going on here? Um, if we're able to see the data. Oh, we get some buffer. That's not what we want. So no JS read file to JSON. Read JSON file. Uh, this is fine. JSON. Actually, we should just use read file sync, shouldn't we? Why am I doing that? Read file sync data store .json. We can quit that. Uh, quit that. Let data equal to that. Whoops. Okay, and then we go. JSON.pass. Doesn't like that.
What's going on with this? Read file sync data store.json. Oh, oh, okay. Anyone know what I did wrong? No, no, I, um, I was calling init database, which was clearing the file. So it's deleted the data that was in there. Yeah, because there was, and then I called init again, which wrote over the file with nothing in it. And then I was trying to read nothing from an empty file. Um, which is a really good point. So what we want to do is only do this if it doesn't exist. So we can do something like um, let data is equal to fs.read file sync data store if data is empty or this is an error then create the file, basically, yep. Oops. All right, so now let's keep this here. Let's run this again, and hopefully that didn't clear at that time. So anything's only going to work on the first time we run it. Um, then we call get first user, okay, and then we need to go console.log our data here. Uh, Let's just log the full, the full thing. Cool, and then we get in our console.log, we get our actual data. Making sense so far? It's not crazy, like, especially with, the cool thing about JavaScript and TypeScript is that like, JSON the format is the JavaScript in memory object notation. Like it's the same, they use the JavaScript's memory model for JSON. That's why it's called J JSON. So it's the exact same thing. Um, now this function was called get the first user. So how can we do that? We get the full data, then what do we do? You're, yeah, we just have to get the first one. It's even simpler. So we can just return data of zero. Right? Because data is an array. And the first one, I mean, it depends what you mean by the first one, right? It might mean the youngest age or something like that, but this is fine. So if we return that, in fact, we can also log that to make sure it's working. Um, and we should just get, oh, we get undefined. Oh, okay. Data is an object called data. Um, which isn't a great name, but there you go. Why did I? Um, both work, but in this example, data isn't typed, so TypeScript might not like oh, I guess it, does, it knows that it's got any both work. Uh, it's a habit maybe. Sometimes if you if you need to use a variable as your key, it's more um, does that make sense? Like string key, whoops, const key string is equal to data. You might have some weird, I don't know, maybe this is why I'm doing it. So the pass takes, so remember whenever we store a, store a file on our operating system, um, 
it's not actually JSON. Like this is a, a file of ASCII characters that make up our JSON format. We need to turn that into actual JavaScript memory. And that's what json.pass to does. It takes a data, a, it takes a string, turns it into actual uh, an object. And then I have actual data, exactly. Then I can do whatever I want. Uh, and then I'm taking the first element here, and then I'm returning that. Um, cool. Now, what about um, adding to this? What's the steps that we're going to have to do? So when I say adding, I mean let's add another user. Let's take a step back. What, what would be the first step? If you've got to push to something, what do you need to have? You have to have, we have to get the data again. Exactly right. So let's, um, we have function. So what we would typically do is something like this. Yeah, it's, it's like a, I mean, GitHub Copilot knows what we want to do. We want to get all, we want to get all the data, which we already know how to do, right? We already did that here. So instead of get first user, this was just our little test. Let's change this to get um, data. We get all of that, we, and we just return oops, um, the actual data. This makes sense. Really simple function. Get the data from the file, turn it into an actual JavaScript um, object, and let's return it. Um, now if we want a function to add user, what are we going to have to pass in? What type of data? Be more specific again. What do we want to pass in? If we're adding a, I mean, again, co-pilots. I'm going to turn it off. It's beating me to the punch. We need the user. We need the user that we want to add. Exactly right. Exactly right. Um, so we want the user. Now this is TypeScript, so we should probably define what a user looks like. Type user. Um, I mean, this is a nice. So, what did user have? It was a name, age, and cars. His name is a string. Age is a number. It didn't have that. It had cars, which is an array of strings. Sorry, it's an array of objects. And we can just use object for that. I think that's it, right? That's all the user has? Name, age, cars? Yep. If we want to be really specific, in fact, what we should do is a type of a car. And a car is a name and a model. A name is a string. A model is an array of strings. And then what is, uh, it's an array of cars. So it's really nice in TypeScript to define our types because then it makes it a lot easier. So for example, here we want to add a user is a user. In fact, that should be like this and that should be like this. Then what we can do is we can say let users equal to get data, because that returns back all our um, data, right? In fact, it's not. Let's do JSON to pass of data, get the actual array back. Making sense so far? Yes? No? Yep. Get our users. Now what do we do? Now who said push? Was that you? Yeah, now you're right. We have all the use. It, look, and even Copilot's telling us that's what we want to do too. Users dot push. Oops. Uh, user. Then what do we need to do? Right. Exactly right. And we have this save data here. 
Um, and what this is actually going to be is an array of users, because that's what our actual database is. Right? So we, we're basically saying, here, I'll give you the whole thing. Um, just save this to the file. And the way we do this is really simple. Um, yeah, this is looking pretty good. But we'll just say fs.write um, file sync. Um, and the inverse of json.pass is json.stringify. Take the um, json actual memory, turn it into a string, stringify it, so that it can save it to the file. And save it. Pretty simple. Uh, we just need to call this here. And notice that we're actually going to, when we save it, Copilot was smart enough to know that this, the data is an array of users, but when it's in the data store, that needs to go to the key data. And that's happening here. Do we see that? Yeah. This is the limitation between a file-based data store and a database. You've spotted here why this is really inefficient. Haven't you? Because I, you're right. I have to override this whole file just to add a user at the end. The problem is it's, it's not really feasible. There might be a way for me to do it. Like There might be a way for me to just update the, the file string to put in the thing that I want. Um, but it's a lot of work, and there'll be a lot of edge cases. There'll be times that it goes wrong. Um, you know, maybe it won't be where I expect it to be, something like that. And then you have problems with like different file systems. Maybe the f file doesn't look right. But that's why databases exist. They let you do the least amount of work to change the thing that you really need to change. That is the reason why we don't do this, unless it's a really simple thing that doesn't grow in size. Um, if something's growing in size, like users, you know, that's a classic thing where you're gonna over time you're gonna have more and more users. Um, then something like this is really not what you want to do. Something like a MongoDB database or an SQL database, it structures all the data in such a way that it can do things like that very easily. And yeah, like Fake Oliver said, we could do something like that here, but it's not worth the effort. You, you should just switch to a database. OK, uh, init database. Um, and then writing the whole file to disk. Yep. But with the changes from the push. Exactly, exactly. You're right, it's not efficient. It's not efficient. Um, we got to do add user and then What's really nice is because we're in TypeScript, we get to know what a user looks like. So we, we're adding an object. It's going to have um, a name. We can do fake olive. Age is going to be uh, fake olive. You don't have to give me a real name. I'm going to guess. Um, and then cars. Fake olive, do you have a car? He's in the lecture stream, by the way. Let's give him a second to catch up. Do you have a car? Who's got a car here? No one? PT? Oh, fake olive's got a car. A Mazda 323. Um, now, cars is just an array. Yeah, so it's, a, and then what's it got here? Name and then a model. So the name would be a Mazda, and then the model would be a 323, basically. We don't need that, we don't need that. OK, add user. Add user will save it. So that's looking pretty good. Give that a go. There might be an issue here somewhere. I can't remember. All right. I notice here, actually, do you see how this changed? It's all on one line now. 
So stringify has turned it into one line, um, and then my text editor can format it nicely. But you can see how it's, it didn't have the new lines in there from when stringify saved this as a string. But hopefully what we should see here is at the end, fake all is nice to 323. This is like the purest, simplest form of persistence because it's on a file. No, no. This is as far as we'll go in, in 1531. Um, so there's 3331, the database course, if you want to do actual databases. Um, although, that wasn't me. Uh, but, like, like a, there is a phone here. But, <laughs> it's, it's like, anyway. Um, what was I saying? Uh, oh, oh. Uh, but you, for your iteration four, you could do, um, you could replace this with an actual database as your bonus feature if you're really keen to get playing with it. And you kind of should, like, databases are so important. Yep. Cool. And make sure no one's, like, desperately trying to reach me or something. No? I don't know. Weird. Was this useful a little bit? Yep. Nice little recap with a little demo. What's the time? 3.47. Um, there's less or more things you could do with this. But what's really, you know, I did say this before, but if we look at, is it gone maybe? Is this just the front end? Yeah, that's just the front end. Um, Going to a NoSQL database is really not too different from this. They're built around the idea that if you have um, objects, rather than just like saving to a file, you can save to a database and it does it properly. And you can just add the one user to the existing database. Like it'll handle all of that. But it looks and feels a lot more similar to this. So they're really nice. MongoDB or any NoSQL. Um, I think we also suggested type ORM. In fact, type ORM is, is slightly different again. It's a way to model data, and it handles persistence sort of for you. So you say, like, I've got a first name, it's a string, and I want that to be a column in my dat database. It's a pretty cool idea. It's using TypeScript, uh, JavaScript annotations to do it. So you can do like find a user with the first name of Timber and the last name of Saw. That's quite funny, actually. Um, and then it, you get back the response. So you're just writing JavaScript, and it's using a real database underneath. So type ORM is, is very cool. This is like a real database system within TypeScript. Cool. Um, you also asked a little bit about HTTP. Maybe we can just run through the slides quickly. Do you want to do that, or do you want to just call it? Run through the slides? OK. High level recap of, of um, HTTP. This was a week four lecture, I think, so I think I did give this lecture. Um, this is a fundamental technology. It's, it's one of the most important technologies we have at the moment. Maybe. The way we do this will change, but the core ideas here won't change. Really simply, what this is is we have computing computers, then we had the internet, so we had a way to network computers. All that just means is we plug in some wires into two computers, and they can talk to each other. They can send zeros and ones. Um, but what if I want to send sort of more structured data over some internet? Well, we need to come up with um, agreements on what we should make our data look like, right? I can't send you a bunch of zeros and ones and hope that you know how to put them back together. We need to agree on a way to do that. Um, if you think about it, the English, English language 
is our protocol, right? It's our set of rules, and if you learn the rules and I learn the rules, hopefully, if all things go well, you can understand me <laughs> in, the, in something like this lecture. Um, but all English, like the, and English is a great example because there are other protocols, other languages exist, right? Many of you speak multiple languages. Um, so there's not one correct protocol. HTTP isn't the, it's just a product. English is not the perfect language, right? It's got many, many issues. But it's good enough that it's, fe it's, it's feasible, it works, just like HTTP. There'll be other protocols, there are many other protocols, um, and they're good enough. And some protocols are better for different purposes, right? Um, what HTTP lets us do is it's a protocol for sending data, sending messages over um, the internet to and from systems, software systems. Um, typically, what it was designed for was for sending text or um, hypertext, so marked up text, to and from a web server to a web client. That's what it was initially designed for. It can be used in other ways, just like English can do lots of different things, but that was what it was designed for. So that web browsers, right, um, could access a server via a server name, your URL, and when the server's like, here's some information, um, we agree upon that HTTP protocol, and then the front end knows how to describe or display that information. Is that a question? Yep, HTTP is the language. It's the language of the thing that happens in the middle. Here's another, expanding on that an analogy, if I speak, who's, uh, who like dreams in another language? Or, f no? What I mean is like your first language is not English. Surely, it's, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, if I say something to you, and you're really, like it's not a simple hello, like I'm, I'm describing something, the protocol is English, because I'm speaking English. You might then convert that into something else. Just like I send a HTTP message over to the web server, it, doesn't, it turns it into something else. I don't actually care what it turns it into. Right? So in, your, in iteration two, you added HTTP to your server. The request HTTP message comes. And then what does it do? It turns it into function calls and data and JSON and blah, blah. It's, not, it's no longer HTTP. It's just the format that goes in between. And you've seen what that format looks like. It's requests with headers, with bodies, right? That is the HTTP format. It's grown over time. It used to be very, very simple. Now it's more complex. Um, yep. So the web server needs to know how to interpret HTTP, right? You need to know how to understand English. It needs to know how to interpret the HTTP. Once it's interpreted it and it gets the message, it gets the body, then it does whatever it wants. And the web browser has no idea what it's doing, and neither should it. Yep. Got to be back into English. That's right. Got to, it has to come back as well over HTTP. That's right. Because that's, how, that's what we've decided to do. Make sense conceptually so far? Um, then, so if we need to be able to speak HTTP, we need um, libraries that can do that for us. We're not going to build our own HTTP library. That's a lot of work. Um, and so the most popular ex uh, node HTTP um, server system is, is Express.js, but there are others. Fast.js is another example. Um, and so Fast lets us say, like, OK, I, I know I need to speak HTTP. I need to register a route, because that's how HTTP works. And, and you know, you've used this right now. So, and this is how Express.js has the syntax for allowing you to do this. 
but different HTTP servers might look, the syntax might look different. It's not the syntax that we care about. We just need a way to spin up a server that's listening for requests, and if the request comes in and it's valid HTTP, it can process the request if all goes well. The API is um, basically the list of routes. See uh, AR11? Yeah, if you've got it. Oh, it's, we've got four minutes, yeah. The API is, this is where we'll leave it anyway. The API is the list of routes with the name and the data in the format that we expect that we need to register that we've documented is what I'm expecting. Make sense? Any other questions on it before we... This is, this is actually the best place to leave it. So HTTP in, it always starts off like this most of the time. User types in a URL to the browser, right? You want to go to youtube.com to watch the latest and greatest 1531 lecture. So you go to youtube.com. Your web browser goes, oh, OK, Jake wants to go to youtube.com. It sends the request to the YouTube server because I typed in youtube.com. And the request is going to be a, a basic get request, because that's the HTTP protocol. And the YouTube server says, oh yeah, I know what to do with a get request with no extra information. I need to give it back. What does it give it back? On this line here. Yeah, the home page. It gives back the HTML to display the YouTube.com home page or whatever uh, website you're visiting. That's exactly right. Then you get back this HTML, and now you get back a lot of HTML because websites are really big and bloated. But you get back HTML, it's got some buttons, it's got some things, and if you click a button, what's it going to do? It's going to generate another get request, usually. Or it might be a post request if you're submitting information. And this is HTTP in the middle. And that's it. Then it's up to you, your software, your language, your library, to write all the code that fulfills this requirement. But we use HTTP libraries to handle that HTTP because it's a complex um, protocol and we don't, it's not our job to rewrite that. But this is a, a fundamental technology that's used everywhere. Yeah, that's a post. That's a post. Might not be app.post, right? For example, in YouTube, it might be YouTube slash video ID slash comment post, right? But the, the, the body would be the, the actual comment text that you're posting. It's probably not very good to have app.post. It's like post what, right? That's not a good API design. But that is a design that you could make. Cool? Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. <laughs>